Krishna Charya in some ways is no different than, than us. He's someone who's been involved in the his own in his own self development so that he can contribute that self development to the practice. When I first started uh, learning Hatha Yoga, I um, wasn't really in strongly in this lineage. I was working with Prapala Yoga. Um, it comes out of a very different lineage, which is the age of Krishnacharya. But in around 2002, I started working in the shadow yoga of Shandra Remate, and Remate was a student of Iyengar for 20 years. And of course, Iyengar was a student of Krishnacharya, we could say, sort of through his whole life, even though he only spent <coughs> about two years in his direct company, and by his own admission, only had 10 to 12 lessons in yoga from him. But Iyengar was related to his family, the family ties were strong in that tradition, so he got a lot from him. In my own experience, um, I got a powerful download from Shandor's work. And in 2004, I wanted to learn more about the tradition. I had some of the same kind of scholarly desire to kind of know everything that I see happening in Krishnacharya's life. Um, and I did PhD study for seven years, but I didn't complete a PhD. I, took, I walked out of the master's. And um, I focused a lot on the modern yoga tradition. It really was my kind of my chief excitement. And I really wanted to understand deeply who Krishnacharya was, who his students were, and how this whole phenomena of modern yoga came to be. So I did a lot of study on the 20th century, a lot of study on the 18th century, a lot of study on the 19th century, and there's not a lot of scholars that focus on this area. It's just kind of a small group of people who really deeply explore what's going on in the modern yoga lineage. So I hope to share with you something that's really rich and something that's really unique. Um, I also spent many years as an artist, so I love to create really compelling visual imagery. And I do a lot of research for archetypal imagery, archetypal energy, or imagery, imagery that's really rare out there that um, shows really rare images. So hopefully you guys will enjoy some of that this we'll day. So we'll go to the next slide. So maybe we'll take our hands to our heart and just bow again to some of my teachers and some honor all of the people who kind of contributed to everything that I know. We'll go to the next slide. And the first thought that we kind of need to understand about Krishnacharya that made him unique is that he was one of the last masters of the whole of the Hindu tradition. He was particularly unique in this way. He had this profound passion to know it all. And some of us are like that. We kind of think in terms of knowing. We want to think globally. We want to include everything from a tradition. We want to take it all in. We want to be a master of everything that might be out there. And Krishnacharya was fiercely passionate in this way. And what I want to try and shape for you is what his passions were, what his allegiances were, how his character contributed to the shape of modern yoga that we still experience today, because he put a very specific imprint on it. We kind of swim in that sea, sort of like we're the fish in the ocean and we don't know what water it is. This tradition had a very different shape before Krishnacharya came to it, and the imprint that he made through his teachers and through his own teachings was very specific and it, sh it colored it in a way that we may not fully be aware of. So one of the key things he did, before we advance the slide, let's look at that for a moment, is he tutored, as many of you know, the four great modern teachers of the tradition. There's, a, there's about these four that we point to that had the greatest influence kind of in the lineage from Krishnacharya, but there's others that were taught by Krishnacharya which also had a huge influence. And we think of BKS and Iyengar, and all these pictures of these, or of these teachers when they were young. BKS and Iyengar on the extreme left, and then Krishna Patabi Joyce, and then um, Tita Yudeshvichar, and then Indra Devi. These are teachers that went out into the world and um, had a very strong following. They were world teachers. They weren't just local teachers. And they figured very hugely in the history of yoga. Next slide. So what I hope to kind of unfold for you is what did Krishnacharya teach, or why did Krishnacharya 
teach what he taught to these people, what shaped his understanding of who he was to offer what he offered them and allowed them to kind of disseminate into the world. Because he didn't travel the world much. He stayed in my store, he stayed with his routine, he stayed with his study. People who came to him, he was very gracious about teaching, though he had very strict standards. But these were his emissaries, these were his, his agents, the people that he empowered to work in the world, and he really didn't do that with himself. He didn't go out into the world, he stayed in India. So he was born in Muchkunda Param, in Muchkunda Much, Param, India, which is a small town in South India. And he was a Vaishnava Brahmin. We're going to kind of unfold what it meant means to be a Vaishnava Brahmin. Vaishnava Brahma, Brahmin um, worships Vishnu. And the town that he came from was kind of story. Um, there's all these elements in Krishnacharya's family lineage and who he was that contributed to his worldview. And one of them was just the place he was born. This was kind of a storage city that's kind of true in a lot of places in India. There's legends around these cities where they say it was a central place where Shiva hung out or Vishnu hang out, hung out or some other chief god. And it was no different from Mukunda. In Mukunda, there was this story of Vishnu who approached this king who was a great warrior and he enlisted this king to help fight the gods who were involved in this huge war. And he kind of hung out a while, he meditated and said, ah, I'll give you an answer in about 20 years. And he gathered his power, and then after 20 years he was ready to offer this power to Vishnu, and Vishnu recruited him, and he went out and he defeated these other gods. So there's kind of this key story about a human involved with the gods, and in some ways, Krishnacharya's story, his own story, follows that pattern. His deep, deep devotion to the gods, his regular patterns in his life, the way he never really broke his fidelity or his devotion to his tradition, allowed him to have the power to really change the world. So, if you guys ever seen the, the marks on the forehead of some of the holy people of India? These are called tilaks. And in um, Krishnacharya's case, we get kind of a clue to who he was by his tilak. It's kind of a blessing or a mark or a sign of bowing to their sampradaya, to their tradition, to put these marks on their head each morning. If you see the three marks across the forehead, that's a, a, a Shaivite, someone who follows Shiva. But when you see the marks in a vertical position, that's someone who follows Vishnu. The three lines across the forehead in the Shaivite tradition, people who follow Shiva, is like the trident, the three lines of the trident. But if we see it in the Vaishnavite tradition, it's like the foot of Vishnu that's on the forehead. And in this case, the little mark in the middle is Lakshmi. So you can kind of think of the Yoni in that case. So we have the foot of Vishnu on the head. And there's a classic story of Vishnu putting his foot on the head of a dwarf that challenged him. And in that act, this dwarf became a devotee of Vishnu. And that act is kind of recreated every morning when the Vaishnavite puts the mark on his forehead. He's saying, I bow, I honor, I am offering myself to my tradition so that the power of that tradition will come through me. And what we'll learn is that Krishnacharya was very, very involved in these rituals. He would go to bed at 8 o'clock every night and he would get up, mm, different authorities say different things, somewhere between 2 o'clock or 4 o'clock. Some people say 2, some people say 3, some people say 4, some people say 4. They said he was late, he didn't quite get up before. But we know that he did his rituals, we actually have pictures of him doing his rituals in the morning, and he would set up his day in a very emphatic way so that he could go through it with incredible discipline and have his mind very, very clear so that all of his learning could be offered in an extremely potent way. And it's that internal work that he did that allowed him to be such an incredible force in the world. Often we think, especially in the modern world, that we have to go out into the world, that we have to make contact with the network, that we have to gain all this, this, um, these exterior connections that are social. But the power of um, Krishnacharya was really the work he did internally. How he made himself into the person he was, and how he maintained that with such discipline every single day, to be, be such a potent force for the people that came to learn from him, and he downloaded an incredible amount of energy so that they could go out into the world and actually make those changes. So this is kind of the person we're dealing with. He was, um, his sampradaya, which is just kind of a teaching tradition, a way of understanding a certain um, devotional relationship to a certain god, you might call it a sect or religion, 
um, but it also involved a certain style of study. Isantadaya was the Fentili Iyengar, and we recognize this word Iyengar because we all know um, DKS Iyengar, his key, key, key student, and part of his alliance with Iyengar's family was an alliance of two of these important family lines. Um, Iyengar was a Brahmin, but he was a very poor Brahmin. Um, Krishnamacharya White wasn't quite as poor, but when he came out of his long tutelage in scholarship and with his work with his guru, he was told to, be, to marry, and so his family created an alliance with Iyengar's family. And he married Iyengar's sister, and we'll look a bit more about that. You see a picture of Iyengar over there on the left, and you see his tilak is simpler. They were of slightly different schools, slightly different schools in Vaishnavism, but they were close enough, and this is kind of the way that Indian society set up, set up, set up in all these little castes and all these little subcastes, and these castes that um, are alike tend to intermarry, and the ones that are unlike don't intermarry. So there was this close relationship between the tradition of Iyengar's family and of Krishnamacharya's family. You actually you see similar names. Iyengar's um, father was actually named Krishnamachar, and Iyengar's middle name, that K, stands for Krishnamachar. So he had similar names. We see these names also repeat within the Sampadaya. Um, um, because of those relationships, that's how Krishnamachari kind of came into the life of Iyengar and the family life. So it's on what Krishnamachari's symbol is called the Urdhva Kundra, and that much similar one that is being worn by Iyengar, Sri Charanam. And they followed the uh, Ramanuja, who was a great saint, um, around the middle of the Middle Ages, one year 1000, and they um, also followed Nakamuni, who was a great yogi. And there's this famous story, of course, of Krishnacharya channeling a great text from Nakamuni. Next. Um, so this is the other thing that um, we can understand about Krishnacharya that made him who he was is he came from this very, very powerful Brahmin family that was involved in the relationship to royalty. In his later life, he will establish a relationship with a very powerful king in India, perhaps the most powerful king of the small potentates, the small kingdoms in India, named King Wadiyar IV. But his family had a relationship with the Mayasur kingship for years and years and years back, way years back. His great-grandfather was the pontiff of Parakalamath, and Parapala Math was this monastery which was actually right next door to the Mysore Palace where the kings lived, and they were the advisors to the king. They were kind of the sages, the in resident sages. Um, and that, um, uh, the man who was the pontiff from 1883 to 1915 was um, Krishmacharya's grandfather. And in 1915, Krishmacharya was offered the opportunity to become the pontiff of Parakalama. So that's how high Krishnacharya was in the level of scholarship that he had attained and the honor that his family had. He had this opportunity to be appointed the head of this institution, which was the main informing arm at the religious level of the kingdom of Mysore. So a very, very prestigious place. And he was actually when the pontiff died and that, that pontiff who received the uh, pontiffship in um, 1915, died in 1925, they'd offered it to him again. And both times, because he was devoted to this path of learning, the first time he, he didn't take it because he wanted to learn more. The second time he didn't take it because he'd already committed himself to yoga. He was committed to a different kind of portion of the tradition, and he was actually morphing the tradition in a new way. He didn't accept this kind of institutional position that he got. So the other thing that um, is helpful to know about Krishnacharya is he came of age during the struggle for Indian independence. Um, the Indian National Congress was formed in 1883. Um, uh, Gandhi went to South Africa in 1893. He came back to India in 1915 and started his Satyagraha, his um, truth um, power movement in India. and. By the 1930s, when he was forming his ideas of yoga, Krishnacharya was in this milieu of actors who were attempting to change the quality of the Indian nation so that it could resist the British. And that's kind of an interesting formula that we have to pay attention to. It wasn't about them really fighting the British, 
It was about him changing themselves so that they could fight for Europe. So, Krishnacharya was a very strong nationalist, and we encounter this in his writings a lot. He was very, very concerned with keeping yoga, which he saw as one of the greatest gifts of India to the world, as being centered in India. He wanted India to remain the authority of yoga, and he wanted yoga to serve the youth of India, to make them strong so that they could resist the British. He wanted to improve their character, he wanted to improve their physical bodies, and so he was involved in these kind of teaching junkets around the world. When he allied with the King of Mysore, who shared these same aims, they sort of supported each other in helping the Indian nation be strong so that they resist the British. So the Indian independence movement was, we wouldn't think of it directly, we think, oh, Gandhi and Kishore was the relationship there, but there actually was a strong relationship in the style of the work they were offering to the world. It had this larger intention. Safety. So the other thing that, um, other kind of force that Krishnacharya was riding was this force of yoga. And yoga senses sort of bloomed and become the more, most kind of marquee sign of India's, India's culture. And even in his day, that was very much true. The Swami Vivekananda had come out of India in 1893. He landed in America. He made a huge splash in America, became a celebrity. And what he did is he talked about the Indian tradition of Vedanta, one of the chief um, uh, um, Nastika philosophies, and yoga itself, and he translated it in terms that the West could understand. And after this, yoga began to, began to kind of shift in the way it was understood in the West and become one of the marquee productions of Indian culture for Westerners to understand and to be excited about. It started to meld with physical culture in the West, um, practicing what we would call fitness. And what um, Vivekananda did, which um, Krishnacharya kind of continues, is he links the yoga of the current Indian tradition to the Yoga Sutras. And that was kind of a, a um, indirect move, because before that, the yoga of India was tied to the text of the Hatha Yoga tradition. And they had a very different flavor than the Yoga Sutras. The Yoga Sutras were produced around 200, 400 of the Common Era. The um, Hatha Yoga Pradipika, the Grand Gita, the Shiva Sanhita were produced around the Middle Ages, about a thousand years later, in a very, very different tradition. And one that didn't have the prestige of Patanjali's understanding of the tradition. So what Vivekananda did, and what also Krishnacharya did, is they tied the tradition to a text with a very, very different flavor. A different mood, a different disposition, and sort of a very different purpose, even. A different way of moving forward in yoga. And that is an imprint that we still take today. We look to the Yoga Sutras, sort of the Bible of modern yoga. It's the, it's the primary authority we look at, and we look at it for that reason because of the work of the Nanda and Krishnacharya and a host of others, but they're kind of our chief people that reoriented the tradition toward Yoga Sutra. The other thing that helps us understand about Krishnacharya is he was a devoted ritualist. Um, and I've also kind of, already, kind of already referred to this. He was deeply self-disciplined. And that discipline that he had in himself, he was able to offer to others. If he wasn't so disciplined himself, he wouldn't have been able to like bring people into his space, have them really pay attention, have them really be present, and be able to download the depth of information that he had. He was so internally focused on his way of relating to his tradition and relating to the world, set himself up every day to see just a range of pictures, and these pictures that can go on and on and on. Um, his son, Desik Shachar, one morning just went in and took pictures of him as he went through all of his daily evolution. The way he moved his body, the kind of bowing he did, the kind of chants he said every morning. He would do this for like two hours before he even walked out into the world. So he framed himself and so fully, and that framing allowed him very strongly to do the work he did and to offer his Yeah. Yeah, yeah, stop me any time, right? Sometimes I feel like I'm kind of lost in your monologue. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, back to the bringing in of the Yoga Sutras. 
Yeah. Um, just to make sure I understand correctly, is was it, Yeah, for him, for him it was kind of always that way because um, he learned it when he was young in his own family. When he was five years old. Yeah, Well, he, he did reference Hapio to the He even taught Hapio to the He taught him to the He taught him to the He taught him to the Sutras. 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 He taught him Western society was reaching out to India and India's tradition, trying to integrate them into Western understanding. They were also looking at the sutras. The, the um, couple of key translations of the sutras were actually um, supported by the Theosophical, the Theosophical Society. They published them. So, in Krishnacharya's own life, he was focused on the sutras, and he started into this guy. You can actually go to the next slide. He started into this guy, Ganganathya. Ganganathya was also related to the Theosophists. And he was a scholar who was interested also in turning yoga back towards the yoga sutras as the primary authority. He was himself an extremely prominent authority, scholarly authority in India, who published important books on the yoga sutras, and he was a teacher of Krishnacharya. Krishnacharya probably gravitated him because he shared his bias, but he was more fully informed by this relationship with So this um, this dialogue was sutras existed, and it waxed and waned throughout yoga history. There were times when there were a lot of production and commentaries in yoga sutras, and times when it was almost nearly forgotten. And we see a kind of a revival in 1809 with the, um, the uh, scholars from um, the West. They start to take a look at yoga sutras. In fact, as early as um, uh, 1895 is the translation of the Bhagavad Gita, the first Sanskrit translation of a text into English. You get a little note from Charles Wilkins who translates that on the road of Patanjali. So Patanjali comes into the Western tradition as early as we get the translation of Sanskrit text and just accelerates through the years to get um, the first full translation in 1853. And then in the 1880s it really keeps up. We get about four translations in and then Vivekananda, the work of Vivekananda is key because he takes the Yoga Sutras and he translates it into an American idiom. He uses the language of kind of the New Age thought of the day, which we call New Thought, where they were working with all these ideas around change of mind to control the world. And he took the Yoga Sutras and he looked at it through that lens and discussed it in those terms. And he wrote this book called Raja Yoga, which became a bestseller. And it was a translation of the sutra. So the Western tradition, which we call an Anglophone tradition, the English language tradition, which was really <coughs> started by the groups of scholars, Western scholars, and the first Indians who, who were English language speakers who were translating those texts. That tradition was very fully focused on the sutra. And it continued, you know, it just, it just gains in power as we move through yoga history. But Christian Charlie was a key note. He was someone who, especially in his family tradition, the Deskachar, the Deskachar took, took the Yoga Sutras and he really strongly took it out of what we would call shramana context, the context of just a lone yogi, someone who uses this text just for their own personal development, and he turned it towards householder intention. He said, oh, this is good for all of us. You don't have to be an exclusive yogi. Yoga Sutras isn't just this pure manual that someone who is really strongly would have to use. All of us can use it. So that was also a really big shift in the way that we use the sutras. It wasn't just going to be for yoga, it was actually going to be for your whole lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, I mean, it's good to get a question. And I got up this morning and it's kind of accelerated. <laughs> um, and I'm not quite sunk, sunk in as I'd like to be.
but I usually start my lectures by just kind of offering, um, throwing it out to you guys and saying, do you have any things that you came to this lecture that you were hoping to learn about Christian Charity? It's actually nice to me to kind of have a dialogue with that with you guys. Is there something that you kind of thought about Christian Charity and answer that to a question you'd like to get answered by coming to this lecture today? Thought to tell about it? No, I mean, I'd be interested in his asking the teacher whatever we know about him. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah we'll get into Brahm Mohana from Chari and talk a little bit about him. There's not a lot of information, but I'll tell you what I know. I have a question about the mix between Vedic tradition and the Tantric tradition. They are very yeah. different, and somehow he combined both, or he brought both together. That's uh, very curious how, when that happens. And how that happens because, of course, the rituals are Vedic, mm. but at the same time, he dive in deeply in this asana practice and then it's more tantric. So, I see different words here coming together. Yeah. So, um, and what we need to understand about that is that the um, Advaita tradition, the tradition that he was involved in, this very orthodox tradition, this very household oriented tradition, for the last few hundred years had really been co opting yoga. So we see in the family tradition, and that's how these ideas and understandings are passed on. Usually the father was a guru and was offering to his children. In family traditions, we start to have a focus on yoga in Advaita households. So that co-option of yoga from the tantric tradition has a very long tradition in Advaita. So all the kind of tantric spirit and tantric elements that tended to be a little unorthodox, what we call heterodox, were not something that the Advaitans were excited about. In fact, they very much defined themselves in opposition to the spirit of Tantra. So they were using the technologies that came out of the Tantra matrix that produced Hatha Yoga, but even those, when we look at Hatha Yoga, it trimmed away so much of Tantra and reduced it to just physical body science. So that physical body science, in some ways, was very non-sectarian. It was a technology, a physical technology, that could be used by any tradition. And that's part of why yoga works for us today, right? Is that all of us, regardless of our background, oh, we've got this technology of the body, it's not related to any religion or God. We can use it any way we want. So that was part of Hatha Yoga's success, is it redefined itself away from the tantric tradition. So, when, so to answer your question, when um, Krishnacharya picked it up, it had already sort of been cleansed of its tantric elements. And when he taught Hatha Yoga Pradipika, Pradipika, he left out those parts that tended to be more about the sexual energies in the body because it wasn't appropriate for his disposition. Because they were all about doing things, you know, in the right hand way, in the Vedic way, in the householder way, in the way that was very much um, uh, conservative, lifestyle conservative. Did I answer your question? Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Anything else you wanted to get answered? All right, let's go forward. So just, let's just hang on this slide for a moment. <clears throat> so what I was saying was um, Krishmacharya was very focused on knowing. His uh, father died, he was born in 1888, his father died in um, 1898, and the family moved to Mysore then. And when he moved to Mysore at a young age, at the age of 10, he started to become a student at the Parakala Math. In fact, he started to learn from his great grandfather. Um, in 1906, at the age of 18, he left Mysore and started about 10 years of wandering, in which he did a ton of scholarly work, very, very deep scholarly work. And he had an incredible gift for it. We have these repeated stories about his scholarly career where he went into this really challenging scholarly program and within like one fifth of the time of all the other students he was able to master it, pass the examination and move on. 
So he was incredibly well prepared. His father was a teacher of the Vedas. So he got it in his, um, his um, household. But he was also uniquely gifted. He had a uniquely clear mind and good rational processes. And over the 10 years, he learned an immense amount. He traveled actually quite a bit. We don't think of um, Krishnachari as much as a world traveler, but in the area that he lived, he did get out. And he was in Mysore, of course, he went up to Benares or Varanasi, Kashi, on the, on the um, river. He got into Afghanistan, he went to Kabul. He learned um, Ayurveda in Calcutta, and he learned Buddhist yoga in Patna, which is in Mongar, which is sort of near Nepal. And then, of course, when he studied with his guru, he was get a lot of different accounts. Some people say where he was, he was in Nepal, some say he was in Tibet, some people say he was in northern India. We'll just kind of sort that out a little bit. But he was all about really getting up on all the base philosophies and base practices of the Indian tradition. He did a very good job of it, and a very, really, really rare job. Few people equal to him in the way that he really consumed all the knowledge of his culture. He's, this is really the key time he did. He actually left his family. His family didn't really want him to go. He said, you know, I've got a mission. I'm going to do this. And he traveled around India and went to a lot of different places. And learned a lot. We'll go to the next slide. So his kind of seminal and um, legendary relationship is with this guy, Ram Mohan from Achari. And Nigel asked, you know, what we know about him. Um, he was this guy who, in the legend, he lived um, near Mount Kailash in Lake Manasarovar, which is kind of this holy place where Shiva was said to be born. But um, there's actually a lot of conflicting information. And in the introduction to a book he wrote in 1934 called the Yoga Makaranda, before kind of this whole other legend got going, he said that he studied near the Gandaki River, which is just in India near the Nepali border. So that he actually wasn't near Mount Kailash. So, we, you know, as a reader in this stuff, you kind of try and sort out what the truth is and what seems more true. And the fact that he made the statement kind of early on in his career in 1934, before kind of his sons and other family members got a hold of his uh, legend and started to spread it, it seems like that's more accurate information. So, he, but he was still in the north. He was here, still near the Himalayas. And uh, the story you get of this guru is he was kind of a unique guy. Um, he lived in a cave with his family. And we get through his, of course, living in case, but you really don't get them living with his family. Um, and Krishnacharya learned about him from Gangana. Yeah, he said, oh, this, if you really want to learn yoga, and by that time he had become a yoga teacher. He was actually teaching some of the um, um, sons and daughters of the um, scholars that he was working with. If you really want to learn yoga, go up to this guy, Ram Mohana Brahmachari, because he's a real master and he will teach you. So he kind of had the classic guru cello relationship. He supposedly walked all the way to this place called Simla, which is uh, this hill town where the, he had this British commissioner, and he, he got permission to kind of pass beyond him and get to meet this guy, Ramohana Brahmachari. He took him in, and for seven years, though he supposedly left from time to time, he studied with him, and what he learned really was yoga therapy. He learned from this book called the Yoga Karunta, and there's been a lot of talk about the Yoga Karunta. The Yoga Karunta, the latest information on it was, it was a it was a Nepali text which took the Yoga Sutras and looked at the, the way that yoga can be applied to yoga therapy. He says his master knew 7,000 asanas. He learned 700. Um, we get stories of. Gita tells these stories. She, she learned them from her father Ayangar, who apparently learned from Krishnacharya that um, Ramahana and Pramacharya would make Krishnacharya run up and down the mountain, and then he would bring him back and teach him pranayama <laughs> and force him to do pranayama when he was out of breath. And then he would do things like uh, feed him a lot of jaggery, which is a sweet, and feed him ghee, which is an oil, and then he would have him do his asana practice. So he'd be able to control his intestinal processes because when we do yoga, of course, you guys have experiences to kind of get acid reflux because the energy goes up. Energy, yoga makes the energy go up. It creates the down the energy going up. And he was teaching people to try to control that by having to feed on some really rich foods and then do his yoga practices. 
Um, the other story we get is you would have these poses like Mayurasana, where you're balancing on your hands and your legs behind him and you put weights on his legs. <laughs> so this, um, oh, the other, thing, the other story we get is perhaps a bit more key even, because Krishna Charya is such a harsh taskmaster, is um, uh, Brahmaharna Brahmacharya would wake him up in the middle of the night and make him do yoga poses. He had this way, he supposedly had this really high pitched voice and he would say, Do me, do! And get him to do yoga, and that was his phrase, Do me, do! So those are some of the stories we have with Brahmaharna Brahmacharya. They're kind of weird stories. He was kind of this really weird cat, but he really schooled Krishnacharya really hard, and at the end of this period, he said, well, and this is kind of a traditional thing in the Indian tradition, what do you give your guru at the end of your seven years of training? And he said, well, what do you want me to give you? And he said, well, I want you to give me your life. And your life will be, you will spread yoga, and you will spread it as a household. You won't spread it as a yogi, by that time he was still unmarried, he was married to my husband and he said, you will be a householder, and you will make your living only by yoga. And today, you know, a lot of people are making their living only by yoga, but in that, in that day and age, no one was making their living. Yoga wasn't really a job. You had gurus and stuff. But he was telling them to go out to be in the secular world, as it were, and to be a successful yogi by teaching yoga. So, Krishnacharya took that mission, and he lived it out his whole life. He had a deep, deep allegiance to his guru, he was honored as guru, and that mission became his life. So the thing I just want to say about this is these dates, 1960 to 1923, from looking at material, they just seem the, the clearest to me, because we get this story of him being offered the pontiffship in Prior Math in 1915, and that would make sense because that was about the time that he finished his study. And um, he had had a little bit of time landing. We know that he studied a little bit before he married uh, Amagiriyama, the sister of Krishna, uh, sister of Iyengar in 1925. So we get about two years of that in. Because some of these stories, they say, oh, he went in 1918. Oh, he went in 1950. Oh, he went in 1911. Sometimes they say slightly less than seven years. Sometimes they say seven and a half years. Sometimes they say eight and a half years. But kind of looking at all that information and trying to figure out what the truth is, it seems to me that this makes the most kind of rational answer to the question, when was he actually in, up in the north and studying around the Mohammed Ramacharya? It's probably from 1960 to 1922. That's the date I'm hanging my hat on. <laughs> we have no pictures of the Mohammed Ramacharya. Though we do have some drawings by his daughter of the other Next slide. Uh, is there any reference if he's come from a Kashmir Tantra or, or what kind of tradition is Brahmacharya. Brahmacharya. Yeah. Any knowledge on his tradition? So he has some gurus for sure. Yeah, I never encountered anything mm -hmm. about who his gurus are or what, or what his tradition was. Mm -hmm. I mean, we get this understanding that he was teaching therapeutic yoga, which is kind of unique. You know, there's not a long tradition of that even before Krishnacharya. There's a host of teachers in Krishnacharya's time who start to create yoga therapy. But um, it's kind of rare that his teacher was doing that he was much older. Mm -hmm. The other piece of information we get that is interesting is supposedly he was 230 years old. Mm -hmm. so take that or leave it. <laughs> sure. So the other thing um, that is key to um, Kriticharya was he was patronized by King Wajir IV. King Wajir IV was one of the richest people in the world. He was um, what Gandhi called a Raja Rishi. He was kind of a philosopher king. He was this man who was universally esteemed. He was incredibly generous. He helped develop his kingdom. He created colleges. He made contributions. He um, invested in the latest technologies for his kingdom, uh, uh, city lights and uh, power generating stations. He used his wealth and his influence and his good nature to make Mysore um, part of the, what it is today. Uh, that area is very much a tech hub, and we can trace this kind of cutting edge focus of that part of India clear back to King Wajir and actually his, um, his lineage of kings. They were interested in having a dialogue with what the latest in modernity, what the British were doing, and staying current. 
So, and one of the ways in which um, Wadjer stayed current was that he was a big part of the world physical culture movement. He was the person who hosted the first YMCA World Congress in um, India, and he was involved with these people that at an international level which were really trying to create physical health in the world. And he himself was a physical culture. He took yoga lessons from Kushmacharya and he supported the whole cadre of cutting edge yoga teachers in his kingdom to teach the young men of the court and to go out into the world and teach yoga. And he created this kind of laboratory, as it were, for people who were experimenting with different forms of yoga to make it into physical culture. So Queen King Wajir supported Krishmacharya. He was his benefactor, but he also was kind of a dialogue partner in the shared project of bringing this indigenous practice of yoga in India that was a spiritual practice, transforming it into a physical culture practice, and then taking that practice out into the world, mainly to help um, Indians be strong so that they could stand up against the British, but also to bring pride to the Indian nation. Because like I say, this is like their marquee cultural production. It was what Indians could really hang their hat on. Next slide. Next slide. Oh, and actually, let's go back and I'll just explain that picture. This is really a unique picture of Kishore. I've never seen a picture of him with this look on his face. He looks sad. And if you look, look really closely at that picture, it's a, king of, it's a picture of King Wadiyar. And those are the children that he had in 1940. So I think this picture was taken when Wadiyar died in 1940. He's holding up the picture in kind of an attitude of sadness because he recently died. He was really devoted to his king. Kishwajari wouldn't really take orders from anybody but King Wadiyar. We have a story of um, when he had to teach Indra Devi, the great student, um, great female student. It was King Wadiyar who said, you're going to teach Indra Devi and if you don't want to. And it was because Kishwajari honored him and loved him that he took that order from him. He had a very unique relationship. So the other thing that, and I kind of referenced this a moment ago, the other thing that was key to Kishwajari was he was, he found himself smack dab in the Hatha Yoga Renaissance. The focus on Hatha Yoga had been accelerating since about 1900. Um, Vivekananda taught postures a little bit in America, and his um, brother monk who came in 1896, Abhinanda, also taught postures. And then people were actively using the postures to relax the body in new physical culture systems that were coming into the West. And the Indians were starting to look at the figure of the yogi as a kind of rebel, as kind of an iconic figure who could be someone they could focus on as a model for resisting the British. The yogi was a rebel. The yogi didn't have any allegiances. The yogi was fearless. And the yogi also had control over himself. And that was a big focus in the Indian independence movement. We need to change ourselves. We need to focus ourselves. We need to make ourselves truthful pe people who can resist the British, not at a violent level, but at a nonviolent level that was completely consistent with the whole nonviolent movement of Gandhi. Yoga fed into that. But it also fed, fed into this kind of gathering momentum around physical culture. So what Kishwajari was involved in was this active recalibration of yoga from being a spiritual practice to being a physical culture practice. And he was around all these guys like Tola Vingatesh Iyer, who was extremely famous in this day. You can see how well developed his body was. He said he was the most beautiful man in India. He had, he had, a, he had a, a body that the gods covet. That he used yoga to make his body supple, and he used weight. He used lifting with weight, lifting weight to make his body strong. We had this guy Baba Nopant, who was a king of another kingdom called Aum, the small little kingdom in the uh, British Raj, and he was bringing Surya Namaskar to his kingdom and teaching Surya Namaskar through the institutions, through the schools, through the um, government bureaucracies. He wanted everybody to learn Surya Namaskar. He wanted his whole kingdom to be healthy, and he was a friend of. Kola Venkatesh Iron, and that may have been the way that Krishnacharya learned about Surya Namaskar and integrate, integrated it into his teaching when he brought this idea of vinyasa yoga, moving yoga, into static uh, pose practice. We have Vishnu Ghosh, who you guys may know. You guys, you guys know who Vishnu Ghosh was? Who was Vishnu Ghosh? 
Kushmatari gets this really cool gig with this uh, radio show, and the guy who runs the station says, oh, you can't praise Narayana, you can't praise fishing at the end of the show. And so the next time we went on the show, he said that, I can't end my show by praising Vishnu on this show, so I'm not going to end this show by praising Vishnu. <laughs> and the next day he was fired. <laughs> and when he was asked that, he says, he says, he doesn't support me. This radio manager doesn't support me. Narayana supports me. So he really wasn't about his own wealth, and he wasn't about his own fame, but he did advertise, and he was professional in his practice. And then he used propaganda wisely. Um, even before he met the king of Mysore, he had a patron who was paying for him to go around India and teach groups of young boys this evolving form of physical yoga practice. He was in um, Kaushika, which is a bit south of Hassan, um, kind of north um, east of Mysore, um, working as a coffee plantation manager. And this guy, this um, benefactor, was also supporting him to go around and have these little yoga teaching junkets. When he was in Hassan, a little bit to the north, that he actually met Krishna Prasad and Joy. Um, but he was, this is part of the activity he was involved in before he met King Warrior, and then King Warrior also supported him to keep doing this. He was trying to spread yoga propaganda to, mainly to the young boys of India. But he also was involved in these exhibitions. Um, we have stories of him doing Superman uh, feats of strength where he would stop a moving car and bend an iron bar, or he would stop his part. We have about three different occasions in which he was in an amphitheater with an audience and he had doctors, doctors from Europe usually in every case, who were putting stethoscopes on his heart while he stopped his heart for about two minutes. So he did these exhibitions, again, not to, to um, expand his own fame, how are you doing? but to talk about the power of yoga to the people. He wanted to convince people that this is a stud, something that we were studying, and so he did these miraculous acts as a way of supporting yoga, not supporting himself, but it was propaganda. Next slide. Eric, just a small question. Yeah. In that last slide, yeah. it said that the the boy he's standing on in Kapitasana yeah. is Patabi Joyce. Is yeah. that just a myth? Um, well, we have um, a film of um, Patabi Joyce, it might be Breath of the Gods, where they bring out that very picture and they ask him, they say, are you in this picture? And he goes, yes, I am right there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but that doesn't necessarily mean it's true. It doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But we just go on. He was an exaggerator. Yeah. He was an exaggerator. A lot of these guys were. But, uh, I don't know. It's kind of a nice little legend. Okay, yeah. So the other thing that was great about um, Kishore, he was devoted to his teaching. In his early years, he was an incredibly harsh teacher. He was such a harsh teacher that he drove most of his students away. Um, one of the reasons that Kiva Dagi Joyce was so powerful is because he was one of the last guys who still hung around with Kishore after everybody left. There's such a strong tradition of guruship in the tradition, it's very rare for somebody to leave a teacher or to complain about a teacher, but this is what happened to Krishna Chari. He was so harsh and so mean that the young boys of the Mysore court, they complained to the king. And they said, we don't want to work with this guy anymore, he's too much. <laughs> we had Ayanagar's brother and um, his sister study with him before he, he did, before Ayanagar actually went to live in 1934, and they left. Chari. They said, you don't have anything to do with this guy. He's too mean. And this other student, Keshava Murthy, who was um, Krishnachari's chief student, and we see pictures of him in Yoga Makaranda. There's these pictures of a young boy doing poses in a really amazing way. That's Keshava Murthy. That was Ayangar's um, living mate in Krishnachari's home. And in 1935, he ran away. And Ayangar himself tried to commit suicide. <laughs> he was so distressed around Krishnacharya. Krishnacharya found him by the river. He was going to throw himself in the river and Krishnacharya brought him back home. Krishnacharya wouldn't even let him kill himself. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, really, at that time in Krishnacharya's life where he was so smart and so physically powerful and so revered that the power kind of went to his head. And he was a really, really tough cat. 
And uh, we get a lot of these stories. Um, there's this uh, interview with uh, Kate Batavi Joyce, and uh, he says, what do you say about your master? He says, he's a very smart man, a very disciplined man, a very dangerous man. <laughs> <laughs> when he went to Madras in 1954, he changed. He became much mellower, and it may be just that he evolved, or maybe the circumstances changed. He didn't have his cane behind him anymore. He didn't have his yoga school where supposed to, people had to come to him um, and had to learn from him. That yoga school uh, closed in 1951. Of course, you have Indian independence in 1947, and the, all these small kingdoms were dissolved. So the big institutions of the Indian government didn't want to support a lot of these programs that were already in place. So he kind of lost his job in 1951. He went to Bangalore for two years, and then in 1954 he ended up in Chennai and he was a very different man. And Iyengar talks about this repeatedly, he says, you know, I never knew a nice Krishna Charya. He was a lion when I knew. I don't even know who this guy is that you're talking about. He's so kind and, and cool. He is, because he says the same thing about Iyengar. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Iyengar very much kind of reduplicated the mm. teaching, or the, the style of teaching of his guru. But what we also need to understand is that style is very common. Because the guru is so revered that they can often get away with whatever they want. You know, um, I experienced this with uh, friends and teachers of mine when I was in India. It's like, oh, I know this guy. He's a, he's a, he's a cool guy. You know, I'm hanging out with him. And then I go to take a yoga class. And he's walking around the room and ordering me what to do and being incredibly ferocious. I'm going, dude, like, who are you? Like, you're going to treat me this way? <laughs> yeah. You know. And that's just kind of the tradition in India. There's a different style of pedagogy, a different teaching style, in which the guru walks into the room, it's all about bowing and listening. And often at least a good thing, if that's a, a person with a strong character, an amazing amount of knowledge, it's the best way to learn, to completely surrender to your teacher. But it can also lead to some very fierce moments. Well, what can George do like that then? Um, George is just kind of a sweeter, happier man. Yeah. Loved his wife. They laughed together. He's not known for, I haven't heard any ferocious episodes. I mean, he was severe in a way. He told people to do things that were very aggressive, but you don't get stories of him being unkind. You might know more about that than I do. No, I'd agree with you, yeah. yeah. He would be aggressive when it was necessary, that's all. And Indra Devi, of course, was a Westerner, and she only studied with him for like eight months or so. And she was not like that at all. Um, and Jessica Char, I, I, know, I know some episodes of Jessica Char's teaching, and he was kind of fierce, but still, nothing like Jessica Char. But he was, he was pure about it, you know. He, he, he liked to test his students. He did this with Indra Devi, he did it with his own son, Jessica Char. When they came to him and said, oh, I want to learn yoga from you, he said, okay. At 2 a.m. tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't really believe that they were sincere. He would test them. He'd say, he'd say, come in at an extremely early hour and make him walk to the table. But he was devoted to his people. Um, and he was devoted to his wife. You know, um, I was just reflecting on this the other day. So many of the modern yoga traditions have been corrupted by scandal. And in the disciples of Krishnacharya, we really don't get that. I mean, we, there's been something with Kasa, who's the son of, um, of um, Deskachar, but and that's very recent, but there's really been a scandal that's touched his lineage in a really strong way. And I think that had a lot to do with who he was. He was so disciplined. He was so self-contained. He was such an honorable man with so much integrity, devotion to his wife, devotion to his family, not interested in fame, not interested in money, that that way of being was really given to his chief student. And part of that capacity to stay in the narrow track, to stay in proper relationship to your art and to the people that you teach, um, allowed what he offered to have the historical impact that it offered. This is no small thing. Next one. What is Krishnacharya's legacy? Go to the next. So, 
We often say that Kishitari is the father of modern yoga, but it can't be denied that Iyengar is probably the greatest modern teacher of yoga. Um, Iyengar had an interesting relationship to his teacher. Um, he was his brother-in-law. So he was related to him in multiple ways. He was a member of the same Sampradaya. Um, they were both Sri Vaishnavites. Um, Krishnacharya was much older than him. Um, Iyengar was born in 1915, and Krishnacharya was born in 1888. Um, Kushitari was 37, year old, 37 years old when he married Iyengar's older sister, um, Namagiriyama, at the age of 11. So this very fierce man came into his family circle. Um, two years after this, Iyengar's father died. And when your father dies in Indian culture, it means a lot more than in a lot of other cultures. You're very, very bereft. And Iyengar's most of his uh, older brothers and sisters, he had nine of them, were married, and the ones that weren't married um, were kind of trundled off to the married couples to live, and Iyengar was left with his mother in Bangalore. Kind of the last man standing. He was um, a very sickly child, and he couldn't study in school because he was often too weak to study. He was very vulnerable. So this fierce man is kind of in the orbit of the Iyengar family, in 1934, um, Krishnacharya is on his way to visit Kuvalyananda, that Swami that I mentioned before, who's doing medical research up in um, the north in Lanavala. He stops in Bangalore and he meets Iyengar and he says, My wife is back home. She is you know, your sister. I don't have anybody to take care of her. I've got to go do some visiting for three months. I'll give you a train ticket. Will you go back and live with her while I'm gone? Um, Iyengar agrees to do that, partly because he needs to be supported. He's not being well supported by his um, wife who's a widow, or his mother who's a widow. He goes back to um, Mysore. Krishnachari comes back, and at that point, the summer is over, and Iyengar wants to go back to be with his friends in Bangalore. But Krishnacharya, for some reason, wants him to stay, and I'm guessing it's because he wanted to support him. He knew that he wasn't well supported. He needed a family. So he, he tempts him. He says, you're so unhealthy. I will teach you yoga. I will let you regain your health if you stay with me. And Iyengar kind of waffles on this, but finally he decides, okay, I'm going to live with this guy. By this time, you know, he hadn't really shown his true color. But Iyengar makes a commitment, and Krishnacharya teaches him a few postures and then basically doesn't teach him again for about a year. Gives him just this little dose of yoga. Actually, Iyengar started uh, learning on his own even then because he couldn't even touch his knee. And the next time that he approaches Krishnacharya and asks him to learn from him, he says, you are an Andhakara. You are not privileged in this lifetime to learn yoga. So he kind of enticed him with his promise, but then he doesn't follow through on the promise. But then things shift. Like I say, Keshava Murthy runs away, and <laughs> Iyengar uses his language, and he says, then his eyes turned on me. <laughs> <laughs> and he focused on Iyengar and did teach him some things. He says, he broke my back for three days. And what he says, he put him in these uh, acro yoga postures, put the chariot laid on his back, he put Iyengar on his back, on his feet, and he lengthened out his spine. And so he, he prepared him for three days to and postures. Again, he left him alone. He said, three months from now, I want you to be ready. There's going to be this um, uh, exhibit where I need some of my strong students. Um, we have this dignitary that's visiting King Wadhir, and I want to show off my best students, and I need you to be ready. So he spent three months studying uh, about the same week that he has this exhibit. He fails his examinations in school. He drops out of school. He wins this competition. He gets a gold medal from King Wadhir, and his Iyengar's path is kind of set. The same week that he fails in kind of a mainstream way of making it in life, he makes it in yoga. And what's also unique is that for the first time, Krishnacharya gives him a compliment. And it's funny, I did a lot of study on the psychology of people who are kind of in hostage situations. 
like you, they have this um, kind of uh, syndrome. What is it? Oh, it's the end. But the, the Stockholm syndrome, right? Where people fall in with people who are really mean and dangerous. And one of the formulas of that is that they occasionally treat them nice. And this is just my theory. I think part of what was going on with that anger, he was locked into this relationship with this really fierce man who physically abused him, who didn't feed him, who made him do this outrageous thing that tested his body. Um, he would tell him one thing one minute and tell him a different thing the next. The next. He was always distressed in his state of mind, very uncomfortable. But occasionally, he would be nice to him. So he stayed in a league. I think he was in Stockholm Syndrome. <laughs> So, anyway, he had this relationship to Christian Charlie. It was a family relationship and a guru relationship. A very, very intense relationship. It was a very difficult relationship. But at the end of the day, you have to kind of wonder, did Krishna Charlie know that Iyengar, even though he was very weak, that he would have shown up with enough willpower to fight his way through Krishna Charlie's own teaching so that he would become the great teacher that he became? You know, we don't know how wise Krishna Charlie was. Maybe all of this was a part of his intelligence. Because it certainly worked out in an amazingly good way. We give him the benefit of the doubt. Excellent. So we met David Cobb Joyce and Sana in 1927. Um, and again, a lot of conflicting accounts. Either he stayed with him for two years or he stayed with him for four years. When Kushishari returned to Mysore and met, the, met King Wadir in 1931 and became patronized by King Wadir, um, that same year, Patabi Joyce came to study at the Sanskrit College in Mysore and they were reunited by chance and he became a student. Um, uh, Patabi Joyce studied with him off and on up through 1951. So he had a very long term relationship with Krishnacharya. He married Amma, who was Krishnacharya's chief female student. So there was a number of intimate relationships that um, Joyce and um, Krishnacharya had, but it seems that even though Joyce was in the vicinity of um, Krishnacharya, he wasn't in day-to-day -day contact with him. He wasn't learning with him all the, day, all the time. He was actually became a big um, in 1935, I think, if I have the date right of the Sanskrit College. He became a professor there, so he had his own duties. Um, but he was still teaching yoga, and he was in contact with Krishnacharya. Occasionally we know that he was learning philosophy him, from him when he was learning Panayama. Next slide. And then Indra Devi was married to a Czech diplomat by the name of Yin Shvataki, and so she was involved in the court of Mysore through this Czechoslovak um, business council that Shvataki was the head of. And Indra Devi kind of came from a uh, high-end family. She was used to kind of traveling in the circle of wealthy people. There's a new biography out of Indra Devi, and I'm eager to read it. I recommend it to you. It's uh, by a woman by the name of Michelle Goldberg. We'll learn more about her history. But she was uh, excited about India in the 1920s. She met um, Krishnamurti and uh, was in his teachings in India. He was involved with the Mysore court. And um, she met Krishnacharya. She actually saw one of his exhibitions of the yogi power, but she didn't have a personal relationship with him. In 1937, she went back to um, uh, Mysore to go to the prince's wedding. And at that time, she decided that she wanted to learn yoga from Krishnacharya. And she studied with him for about eight months. Um, she, from there, she went to teach yoga in Shanghai in the middle of World War II. Um, she was actually teaching in the bedroom of Madame Chiang Kai-shek, who was the wife of the leader Chiang Kai-shek of the nationalist forces in, in uh, China. So she, was, she had this kind of weird relationship throughout her whole career. She always seems to be in the right place at the right time where everything was happening. After that, she came back to America in 1947. She'd written her first book. Came back to India briefly. Her husband died. And she wrote her first book, and then she came to America, and she was in the middle of the Hollywood starlets, and all. they all came and learned from her, including Marilyn Monroe. So, um, and then she was kind of just a, a world diplomat yoga to Russia, she went throughout South America, and she spread the practice, and she also had incredible character. She was uh, revered, she was called Mataji, everybody loved her. 
And she did a lot to spread yoga throughout her Um, it's by one by the name of Michelle Goldberg, um, and the title's not coming to me at the moment, but it just came out like last month. Okay. And they just interviewed her on NPR, a cool little interview with her on NPR. Okay. Next slide. And then, of course, um, his own sons and daughters were influenced by his teaching. Um, T.K. Srinivasan, who I couldn't find a picture of, his son, who was born in 1936, became a teacher of the Vedas, of Vedanta. Um, Sri Bhashyam became sort of a world teacher. He teaches in France and throughout Europe. And of course, Deskachar is one of the world's greatest teachers of yoga. Um, he didn't start studying yoga in serious way with his father until 1960, when he was um, 22 years old. He kind of rejected his father. He didn't think much of him, but one time this American woman kind of came to their house. She came out of this beautiful, amazing automobile, and she runs up to Krishna Chari and she gives him a hug. And that's just not something that these Brahmins do. And she got back into her car and drove away, and Deska Chari goes, what was that all about? You know, why was this woman hugging him? And he says, well, she hasn't been able to sleep for two years. She's had headaches and asthma and hasn't been able to cure her. And Deska Chari said, can you teach me this, Father? He said, no, I'm not going to teach you. <laughs> you're not a serious student. And so, that teacher had to really beg him, and he did the same thing with him. He said, okay, show up in my room at 2 a.m. tomorrow, and we'll see. But he became, of course, one of his deepest students. He was living with his father, and he stayed with him until he died in 1989. So, that teacher created the Shrimpari um, uh, Yoga Mandaram Institution to distribute his teachings. He created a publishing house that also offered the books of Shrimpari. So, he's been really like the holder of the tradition, but uh, now he actually has dementia. So he can't teach anymore. So we kind of lost Deskin Char. Not as if he physically died, but he's really not able to teach. Um, but he's been one of the main kind of carrying, carrying honors of um, the entire tradition. Suva is a local teacher in my school. So three of his six students went on to teach yoga. Next slide. And then he had a few other teachers that studied with him a long time. Um, Srivastava Ramaswamy started studying with him in 1955. Um, A.G. Mohan studied also with him for many years. Ramaswamy and Mohan were trustees of the Krishnamacharya Yoga Mandaram. They helped start it. They were intimately involved with Krishnamacharya's family. Mohan's still alive. He's still studying with him. Ramaswamy's still alive. He's still studying with him. Srivastava is still alive. He's still studying with him. B.N.S. Iyengar teaches the um, a uh, similar form to K. Prataba Joyce's style in Mysore. He's still alive and studying with him. Uh, Joyce and Iyengar, of course, have passed away. But his tradition is very much alive not only in us, but some of his teach te te teachers who had day-to-day -day contact with him. Next slide. So the other thing that made uh, Krishnacharya's teaching land so well is that Sort of like the Kananda, he offered it, even though he was such a sectarian, he offered it outside of a sectarian context. He wasn't interested in making people into Vishnu worshippers. He wasn't so tied to his tradition that he didn't have some objectivity on it and say, you know, if you want to leave this part out of it, out of it don't worry about it. Whatever you as a student can learn or can take in, take it in that way. If you need to worship Jesus, if you need to worship Buddha, if you need to worship Muhammad while you learn yoga, that's fine. He really was a strong secularist. He had enough awareness of himself, even though he was kind of fierce about his teaching, that people were made differently. He came from a polyglot context. India is a place where there's a lot of different contending sects and religions. He respected those religions. And he realized that if he's going to pass this on powerfully, he needs to let it be just information. Let it be a kind of um, intellectual exercise. And sometimes when I reflect on the power of Krishnacharya and you know, why he is the guy we look through in history, to in history, not only for all these other reasons, it's that he's kind of like us modern people. Even though he was such a religious guy, he had this way of making it into just simply information, into kind of um, uh, put it in terms of a secular understanding 
that we can relate to who he was. He was a saint in a way, but he kind of wasn't. He wasn't so far removed from us. He was more like an acharya, just a teacher, rather than kind of some sectarian guru like Shivananda. Shivananda also worked throughout his whole career to contribute to Hatha Yoga, not so exclusively like Krishnacharya, but I think we don't have as much comfort with someone like Shivananda because he was a saint. You know? It's hard to relate to him. But Krishnacharya was a family man, and he was an intellectual, and he was kind of a secularist. So there's elements in his character which make him more amenable to us. And I think that's part of why we can kind of relate to his tradition and his teachers. He was very much a modern character. The other thing that Kushitarya did is he really understood that women were the future of yoga. And that played out. He taught his wife. He taught the sisters of Iyengar. He taught Amma, who was the wife of Kepitabi Joyce. Um, in this uh, film, that if we have time to look at it, we'll see him doing acro yoga with his daughters, Alamel, Alamu, Alamu, and Kudarkar Kavali. He wanted women to um, know yoga partly because he respected women as the uh, people who carried on the lineage of the whole race, but also because he knew that he was in a time when the traditions were threatened and that the old doctrinaire, orthodox standards that said, oh, only people, members of my caste and only males can learn this tradition, those things had to be thrown away because the tradition wasn't going to survive unless he just opened the doors and taught everybody. So he had a unique respect for women. He saw that their place in society, and this is kind of old school, they had, the place, they had the role of nurturing children and nurturing the next generation. Yoga had to enrich them. It had to support their pregnancies. It had to support their relationship to menstruation. It had to support the unique um, qualities of a woman's body and psychology. And so he, when he wrote this book called Yoga Rahasya, that he probably composed around 1935, it wasn't published until after his death, there are whole chapters devoted to yoga for pregnancy, pranayama, different um, uh, physical um, pose practices which serve women. Because he knew that the tradition if it was really going to survive, had to kind of <coughs> jump the bounds of the old orthodox um, um, narrowness that it had before. So, he, so the story, and I, I even heard it told in that um, interview with Michelle Goldberg on NPR that he refused and dead because he was a woman it doesn't make any sense. He was teaching women way back in the 1920s. So if in 1938 she came to him and he didn't want to teach women, that doesn't make any sense. He didn't want to teach her because she was a foreigner. He didn't have foreign students. He didn't want India's yoga knowledge to be put in the hands of people who are not Indian. And he talks about this in Yoga Makarana, and he says, we may be facing a dark future when the Europeans come and teach us our yoga. <laughs> and that's already happened, right? I mean, I think it's all pretty good. But he thought, you know, because he was a nationalist, because he believed in the tradition, he actually, I think he had ideas around it remaining whole. He didn't want it to become shallow, he didn't want to become diluted. He wanted it to stay in India, and he wanted the heritage of India to continue to support the practice. But he did teach it to women because he wanted it to survive. And he made a lot of interesting comments throughout his career. One time he said, um, the men are too busy doing business. The, it's the women who will carry on yoga. <coughs> and in a way, even that's kind of an accurate formula. I think some of the pressures of business are not um, as impactful for women. And women are kind of freer to choose something like yoga, which isn't really a business. Right? I mean, to make yoga into business is a real ch- into business is a real challenge. So to just have that openness and follow your heart and do a practice which you know serves you and serves others, and not worrying about the business concerns, that's kind of the way that yoga has landed in the modern world. And I think that's another reason why women have gravitated to it. Is it's not so much a, a cutthroat choice to choose to teach yoga in your life. You're not choosing that, making that choice as a business person. You're making that choice by following your heart. 
So Kripachar seemed to almost kind of intuit some of these things. A lot of these great teachers seemed to have these intuitions that played out in yoga history in a really interesting way. And that was one of the ways it was formulated in Kripachar. So you have to ask the question. Eric, do you have a theory as to why the overwhelming majority of students are female, but that's not reflected in the teachers? Um, it's also reflected in the teachers. The, the, the ratio is different. The ratio is different. There are definitely yeah. many more male teachers. Yeah, do you have a theory why that might be? Um, I don't know if I would dare say it. Men, we just tend to be driven, right? It's like we, we're driven, yeah? As one of my artist friends said, a man is a line, a woman is a circle. We're driven. Right? I don't know. What would the woman say? Why do you think there's so many male people? I've thought that before, but I don't know that I ever came up with that. Yeah. We've got to stop them. <laughs> our consciousness teaches us to narrow our consciousness. We're so stupid that we spoiled our hobbies. No, 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 no. <laughs> we don't know better. Yeah. Okay, we turn our, turn our hobby into work. Yeah. Well, I mean, why is that commentary saying that you think men are more focused? Well, I think, I think, uh, I think. Testosterone, the, the hormone, I'm getting into a really Um, That's my experience. Yeah. I mean, you think about, about you know, men get into more trouble. 90% of people in jail are men. You know, men. Trying to dig out of the hole. We risk, we fail, we die. You know, we, we create wars. You know, we have this way, our conscience just narrows. Remember, uh, Tell you a story. I, I, uh, I had this girlfriend, and uh, she used to do these um, ayahuasca ceremonies. And she said she told her ayahuasca ceremony uh, holder to, that she wanted to get inside my mind. And she said, "Oh, okay, I can do that." So they did the ayahuasca ceremony, and she went into my mind. The next day, she told me that. She said, I, "I couldn't believe what I saw in your mind. It was all like sing, 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 sing. All these minds." And that's the way my mind works. My mind, my, my mind doesn't work. And I think about a woman, you know, nurturing, holding, kind of global consciousness. My mind is like angular and point to point and making connections here and there. You don't think women do that? Tell me. Well, I do. I yeah, yeah. think women do that. Yeah. I think, I, I, you know, I think men just have a certain ferocity. Okay. They have a ferocity around it. But any time you make a statement about men and women these days, you're walking into this. No. We're just in That's an amazing thing, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, and we have this sacrificial quality, right? We're going to go to the end until we die. The way a male's mind works, it's just like it's sacrificial. We're going to go until we die. Nothing else matters. And you see that throughout history, you know? We go until we die. And that's the way that we serve close we sacrifice ourselves. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I've seen in my 54 years. We'll do a seminar on gender. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do a lot of meditation. Women were all from Yeah, they are, aren't they? And how are women sexual? Tell me. I'm not going to get myself into trouble. I agree. But you tell me. It's a different way, it's a different well, style, is it not? I've, I've, from my observations, it seems that women regularly put others' needs on yeah, their own. Right, that's the way women are sacrificial. Yeah. Definitely. So, men don't do that. No. They put their needs first <laughs> because we were the champion of the family. If we didn't succeed, then the family died. Yeah. Right? We had to fight for the family. Yeah. We had to protect the family. We had to earn for the family. So that egotism has a kind of biological basis. If we didn't live, if we didn't support, if we died, then the family was had no protection, had no safety. And it, 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 the trouble is now in the modern day, right? Now that egotism is burdened. You know, it's a certain liability that it wasn't as much in previous times. Now we've got to fight through it because it's, the society has become more feminine, it's more relational. And ego, your ego gets in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for that insight. Yeah, yeah I had a lot of thoughts about it. My mother was a great feminist, so I got this with my mother's milk, and so I thought about these so many times so throughout my whole life. I get myself in trouble. <laughs> um, but 
But yeah. But he was an amazing guy. He really did understand, I think, he was ahead of himself, ahead of his time, because I don't know if you've ever been to India. India is still it's still like 1950s America. It's still it's still so patriarchal, right? Um, men are somewhat still in the place of public life, in the place of decision making. Women are still in private life, not in the place of decision making. But he was doing this in the 1930s. So it's very much that time, any point. So um, part of what we, you might have seen when we saw a picture of Krishnacharya's rituals is he was doing these prostration practices. He was doing balance. He actually chanted these long sections from the Vedas which were Surya Namaskar um, chants. They were chants to the sun. So his involvement with Surya Namaskar is very deep and complex. When he designed his Vinyasa Yoga, he brought this ritual prostration practice into the yoga. Yeah. He took sun salutation, this bowing that we do the day of the sun, if you guys, somebody took my workshop for the day, um, this is what I taught. Um, he took this bowing practice and he, again, he secularized it. He didn't put the chants in. He didn't say that you were bound to a deity. But the movements themselves that Indians have been doing for hundreds of years, we have, um, we have evidence of this, um, for their, what their nitya didi, their daily practice to make themselves healthy and focused, that was already in the tradition, but it wasn't yoga. It was Vedic practice. It was orthodox practice. It was something householders did to prepare themselves for the day, prepare their mind, prepare their body. We have Sai Baba Nupan, who brings into his kingdom and popularizes popularizes it. If Macharya is trying to create a yoga that young boys can get excited about, they're not going to get so excited about standing still. It's hard enough to get adults to stand still. Get kids to stand still, it's very difficult. So he created these very, very athletic, what some of his contemporaries called circus tricks, gymnastic practices, which young boys could gravitate to, and we have the strong evidence of that in the Mysore style of Akram Yoga, which very much is preserved. He wrote books like Yoga Maharanda, where he described vinyasas for every post. His, he interpreted um, the Yoga Sutras, the 247, um, the focus of the Yoga Sutras as a focus on breath kind of plays with the Sanskrit there and tells us that even the Yoga Sutras are telling us that the posture work is a focus on breath. So we have this idea of Tristana, breath, movement, and bandhas were involved in every yoga pose. And that is what he taught. So he reformulated yoga. He made a vinyasa yoga, which is much more athleticized. And this aspect of ritual prostration is an echo in it kind of in the background. That formula, that form, that movement of the body is contained kind of as a mystery within Ashtanga Yoga. We don't get the full clarity. We don't get the praise to the sun. We don't get all the mantras. We don't get all these other philosophical connections. We get the basic <coughs> movement. It's kind of encoded in a simpler way in the sense of practice. But some some citation is there. <laughs> they took ritual practice and put it in the yoga. Go to the next slide. So you know, let's start praising the sun. Go to the next slide. And he added the dun. He added the move from Indian wrestling. And um, it's questionable as to whether this was in the practice before, but he made it an aggressive movement, the, what we call Uttapasana, um, when you drop down into the first movement of Surya Namaskar when you come out of it. This was a move in Indian wrestling that they would do thousands of times a day to make their body strong. And he was in this milieu where the um, athletic arts were being practiced and he was aware of the way that the um, Indians worked and he integrated this into his practice of yoga in Surya Namaskar. We go to the next slide. The other thing that he added is, well, they called them the Bata. Yeah. And then we call them the Bata in um, Indian wrestling. The other thing he added, oh, sorry. Okay, I'm going to drop it slightly. He added the danda poses. Right? You do plank and up dog and chaturanga and down dog. Those were called dandas. 
They were a set of movements that the wrestlers would do again thousands of times a day to make themselves strong. He took the much more simpler and softer practice of Suryana's scar and he made it very aggressive and athletic by adding the dons and adding it to the top. So he kind of re-engineered Suryana's scar itself and then he added these discrete poses at the end of every one of those vinyasas and he made it this very coherent system that he thought was very healthy for particularly for young bodies. And, and that's very much serving the Ashtanga Vinyasa style. Of as I said before, he popularized the Yoga Sutras. He wrote a, a commentary on the Yoga Sutras called Yoga Bali. Um, he always saw the Yoga Sutras as the ultimate authority of the practice. If there's ever, ever any disagreement in the later text, he would go to Yoga Sutras as the main source. And what we need to understand about Yoga Sutras is it was a very orthodox text. It wasn't a text like Kothi Hatha Yoga Pradipika, which had this whole range of practices and adhered more to the kind of messy system of Tantra. We call Yoga Sutras Raja Yoga, Kingly Yoga, because it has this different dignity to it, this different um, kind of quality in the teaching, and it's very much focused on the abstract work of the mind. It's not focused on the body. We get to, when we start focusing on the body, we start to introduce sexual elements, we start to introduce physical elements that are, might make people a little bit squeamish. And it might take us into territory where we're stepping outside of orthodoxy. But we stay in this world of abstraction, we stay in the world of the mind, everything stays kind of clean and manageable. And that's what Yoga Sutras is. Yoga Sutras is basically a science of mind, it's a yoga of mind. Yoga Sutta Bharti Narodaha, the second sutra. How do we get the mind to focus so that we can produce changes in our understanding? How are we able to see that our true identity is the Drashtra Guru, that we are the seer, we are the sea earth? That is the whole method of Yoga Sutra. It isn't a physical body method, it isn't a Kundalini Yoga. It's not going to get into these messy things like Kriyas where the body is erupting and shifting because prana prana energy is moving through it. You're not getting into that messy stuff. You're going to stay with these top three chakras. You're going to get them to focus. And that's going to be a very clean yoga, very contained yoga. So the yoga, this yoga sutra is really met Kishmachari where, where he was at. He was an orthodox Brahmin. He didn't want to get into the messy stuff. He didn't want to talk about Kundalini. He wanted a Raja yoga, a yoga that is focused on this cleaner approach to enlightenment. One that was very much about focusing the mind so it could see the true nature of reality, and that's consistent with Advaita, but we're looking at it through the Yoga Sutras context. Tadadra Suhus Parupe Vastanam, the third sutra, you are going to realize that you are the seer. That is the method. It's very clean method. Questions? A few people nodding. Next one. So as I said, Kishacharya wrote four books. Yoga Makarana in 1934. I don't know the date of Yoga Bali, the commentary of Yoga Sutras. Um, he wrote Yoga Sthanagalu, which is kind of a variation of Yoga Makarana in 1941. He wrote the Yoga Rahasa, probably 1934, but it was not published until 1990. Um, Eight, about ten years after he died. Um, and uh, these books, he wrote Yoga Maharana in Tamil, and he wrote Yoga Rahasya in Sanskrit, and it was translated. I'm not sure what he wrote the other two books in. But he, because of his tradition, they saw the Tamil languages as equal to Sans- Sanskrit. It's part of the Sinkali Brahmins, that's one of the part of their tradition. So he wrote his books in vernacular languages. And Yoga Makarana was actually translated into Kannada, the local language of Karnataka as well. He saw those languages as almost equally holy to Sanskrit, so he actually composed in those languages. Um, but not a lot of people know his books. Here he is, the most famous yoga teacher of the modern era. Has anybody read any of his, his books? Okay. None has read his books. Um, but um, the books are not well known. And they're a little bit difficult to read because they're composed in the old style, sort of like the old uh, books of the, of the um, Middle Ages. Next slide. Yoga Sutras in Tamil. Next 
So just kind of a minor point. Uh, Jason Demir is here. I don't know if you guys know him or learned from him. He created Yo Acro Yoga in 19, or rather 2004. Um, the whole Acro Yoga style, we see him working in Acro Yoga in this film. If we have time, we'll show a little bit that he's got his daughters up on his legs. So this is a practice that roots all the way back to the 30s. We probably can't root Acro Yoga directly back to Krishnachari, but he was doing this practice, which I think is fantastic. And, uh, Partner yoga practice. And then, of course, his greatest legacy is vinyasa yoga. Most of the styles of practice that we have today derive from um, the Ashtanga yoga, Kepa Tavi Joyce, um, or you know, we have this style that he called vinyasa krama that comes through Patavi Joyce. We have people like Srivastava Ramaswamy who study vinyasa krama, though that doesn't, hasn't really spread through the world. And Kepatabi Joyce, after he studied the practice for 40 years, incubated as it were for 40 years, he comes to America in 1975 and he teaches uh, um, Nancy Gilgoff and uh, uh, Norman Allen and uh, Doug Wil or, uh, uh, David Williams, the people we met in um, India and brought him over to India, California. He teaches them and their students yoga, um, this Ashtanga Vinyasa Yoga, and it's kind of like the monster is out of the box. After this, the world knows that you can do this vinyasa practice, this moving athletic style practice where you can sweat and have a lot of fun. And within about mm, 10 years, you get um, a Roger Cole, who's here at the conference, and um, uh, Tim Williams. Tim Miller. Tim Miller. Tim Miller and Roger Cole start taking Ashtanga yoga apart and they do what they call Surya Namaskara C, which is Surya Namaskara A and Surya Namaskara B. They call it Surya Namaskara C, where they're mixing and matching the poses and putting it together with new vinyasas. And that's basically modern yoga. So modern yoga is sourced back to this vinyasa approach, but then we get a very creative choreographical approach to how we use the vinyasas, and that's basically our modern practice. So, even if you don't know any of these deeper things about Krishnacharya, you've probably done at least one Vinyasa class in your lifetime, so you touched his tradition. That's his biggest and most obvious and clearest legacy. He took this idea of Vinyasa, which is actually a Vedic idea of precise placement, and he took it to the, took it to the body. And then we have his, these katanas, these movements in Indian dance, they're also sometimes called Vinyasa. He borrowed that term from the artistic and Vedic tradition of India, and he took it into yoga. And that's the word we use now for the moving practice of yoga, vinyasa yoga. And there he is doing the Ashtanga series. But he never mentioned in his books about vinyasa. That's the problem. He never mentioned about vinyasa in his books. It's totally not true. Mataranda is all about vinyasa. And so is Yoga, yoga Sanagava. It's all about vinyasa. It describes vinyasa after vinyasa and vinyasa. In fact, he says, yoga can't be done without vinyasa. Okay. We'll sit down and read it together for <laughs> It's true. It, 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 vinyasa was, was the key to his practice and teaching. We'll read yeah. <laughs> What do you think, uh, the yoga karunta? Is it a myth, do you think? Do they really find it and this is based on that? Or? No. No. He's asking about the yoga karunta. It's a mythical book that they found in the Calcutta Library. Yeah, I mean, like you say, you know, they, they, the, and part of this, you know, we kind of misunderstand it and say, oh, they're telling these stories to give false status to something that they create. But it's actually, it's the um, dodge of ego. You don't claim to create it. You claim your guru created it. Because you've got to honor the tradition and you don't want to point to yourself. So, in a way, we can say that's what the Tavi Joyce is doing. He's just telling a story to say, I didn't create this stuff. My guru created it. My guru's guru was the Yoga Karunta created it. You know, the latest information on Yoga Karunta, Deskachar, in the introduction to Makaranda, says it was a Nepali text which was focused on Yoga Therapy. That's, I think, as much as we know about it. Actually, actually then I heard something through a... Uh, um, Anthony Grimm Hall's website that actually found the yoga and they were translating. Wow. Yeah, I came across that. It was some 
And you need to follow up on that a little bit. But the, 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 the word on the street, the latest word on the street, is to do with Eric himself. I mean, the evidence is pretty clear that he created Vinyasa Kali Yoga, but, you know, he's one of the greatest authorities in Indian history. As great as, you know, Garandara, or as great as Svatmaran, the writers of Hathi of the Kali I mean, it came from Krishnacharya, that's no small thing. Yeah. You, know, you don't have to say that it came from another text. Because yeah. more learned than him. You know, he's one of the greatest people to ever walk the earth in terms of yoga, in terms of Indian culture. And whether it's a hundred years old or ten thousand, it's irrelevant because it works. We know it works. Yeah, right. And we know that it came from the trust of the Okay, let's see if we can maybe activate and see. We're about done here, but we'll see if we can see Krishnacharya in action. film on YouTube. It's really pretty cool. You see Krishnacharya in practice. You see a Yangar doing vinyasa style yoga. What's the name? 1938? Yeah, if you just go type in 1938 film in YouTube, you'll get it. Mm -hmm. um, you see uh, Amagiriyama, his wife doing yoga. You see Jammu, who's the sister of Iyengar doing yoga. You see him doing acro yoga with his two daughters. Um, kind of out in the windy area. Probably the, the highlight of it is Krishnacharya's practice. He does pranayama and sort of some cool jump throughs, and you see the amazing, amazing practice of the, um, at that time, uh, it would have been a 19-year-old BTS Iyengar. He's only been practicing yoga for four years. Silent, silent film. Um, any questions you guys have about the further of the story of Krishna Chari? Mm, have I downloaded enough information? I can get the business cards. I can come back and get the color. Check me out on Facebook. Um, 